Good morning, everybody. Let's see if I can get this working. Good morning. Hello. There it is. Good to be with everybody today. It's always a pleasure to worship God with you guys. If you have your Bibles, we're in Genesis 25. If you don't, all the verses are going to be projected up onto the screen. And we're, we're actually going to start closer to the end of the chapter, um, around verse 22. So Genesis 25 represents another big transition within the book. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are more biblical cosmology, right? So they're big kind of symbolic representations of God's creation of the world and how the world goes through subsequent rises and falls of empires. It's, it's really, really fascinating. But heavy, heavy symbolic language utilized in those first 11 chapters. Then in chapter 12, we get our first big transition. We go from biblical cosmology and we go down into the life of Abraham. And that's where we've been for quite a while, studying the life of Abraham and the agreement or the covenant that God made with him and to his descendants. Chapter 25, we're going to shift. We're going to move from Abraham and we're almost going to skip over Isaac, which is really interesting. And we're going to go right into Jacob. Now, Jacob becomes the main character of the book of Genesis for the rest of the book, which is pretty fascinating because the book is about halfway over. So for the second half of the book, Jacob becomes the main character. And in fact, Jacob's name shifts from Jacob to Israel towards the end of his story. So he is really the progenitor of the Israelite people. And that also means that in a lot of ways, he represents us today. For the New Testament authors have, in various times in the New Testament, like Galatians 6, verse 16, called the church the Israel of God. So Jacob becomes a really, really important character for us to understand. What I also love about Jacob is that Abraham, and especially Isaac, are still very zoomed out characters, right? They're, they're more symbolic. They are historical figures, but they're their stories are more of like a, a meta-narrative, right? They're, they're really zoomed out. They, at times, don't really feel like real people. At other times, when they're usually when they're failing, they feel like real people. But for the most part, their stories are just more symbolic. They're more to help us understand what it means to have a relationship with God and how to develop that relationship over time. And even Isaac's story is so symbolic of Christ's that, again, it's hard for us to even see him as a historical figure, though he was. Jacob is awesome because Jacob, you really get to know Jacob, right? You get to see his, his ups, his downs. You get to really, really deeply dive into his person and his identity to figure out what makes him tick, how he became the man that he ends up becoming, and why he is so significant for us today as the church, all these thousands of years later. If you want to kind of get my views on Abraham and how his life ends up and where the, the book of Genesis leaves his story, you could always read my essay. I'm not really going to go into it too much right now. The one verse that I want to read you guys just to, to leave off Abraham's story is Proverbs 13, verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So, so notice the difference between the good man and the wicked man is not that the good man actually builds up wealth, because notice the wicked man does too. It's that the good man builds up a legacy or a name for himself that allows for the wealth to stay within the family. Right. So the wicked person fails to give an inheritance to the children that's spiritual, moral, and significant to their character. So whatever wealth he gives them will be squandered and destroyed. Abraham has, like I said, some ups and downs. He has some really high highs. He's got some really low lows. But at the end of his story, you see that he did this very well. His family seems to be unified at the time of his death. Even a massive separative issue within his family seems to be resolved, where Isaac and Ishmael are at the funeral of Abraham together, and they seem to be getting along. So uh, that, that's the legacy of Abraham. That's the legacy of of what he accomplished. Very, very beautiful to understand. That being said, let's move into Jacob and Esau. So if you, again, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in verse 22. Uh, so Rebecca has become pregnant and it says, but the children struggled within her. And she says, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. 
the writer of Genesis is about to give us like a really, really interesting, like I said, character study of these two individuals, but he's also juxtaposing it against a really deep question that humanity has been asking since the beginning. Is our future or destiny predetermined, or do we have free will? Right, so when you're born, is your destiny already written out for you, and you don't have any free will, or is your destiny kind of a question mark, and it can become whatever you make it? So you have like Terminator 1, where destiny is pretty much sealed up, and no matter what you do, it just turns back into what it's supposed to be, or you got Terminator 2 that undid that, and now you can make the future what you want it, right? That's the big questions that, you know, James Cameron was diving into in that series. But, you know, it's the big questions that people have been asking forever. Even in modern days, people do talk about, like, their zodiac sign or, or what, what sign were you born under. That whole idea is that if, if I'm born under a particular constellation, my personality, my character traits, and even to an extent my destiny is already written for me. It's written in the stars, right? I have very little say in the matter. And what the writer of Genesis is trying to do for us is to try to explain how that works. So we see in one instance, and this, if you just took the, the two verses that we read together, it almost seems like God has predetermined a destiny for Jacob and Esau. But as you read their stories, you realize that they have free will within their destinies. So what we really see is that God has two perspectives on our lives. The first one is, is that your innate characteristics, your personality, your soul, who you are as an identity, that's obviously in many ways predetermined, right? You don't, you don't pick it. Most parents are trying to get their kids not to fight, right? These kids are already at it before they're out of the womb, right? You, you, there's something in their personalities that's already written in the womb, which is very interesting. And again, we'll talk more about that. However, what you're going to see is that their personalities are going to shift as they get older. Jacob is redeemed and Esau is not. And it's really not, like when you study their stories, you realize it's not that God looked at Esau and though Esau was this great guy, God's like, I'm sorry, man, I didn't choose you, so you can't be chosen. It's more that God seems to approve of things within Jacob that Esau never gets. And that is the election, that is the choosing that God has upon his people. It's not as though God makes arbitrary choices at at random of who's in and who's out. It's more like God sees the end from the beginning and he approves of certain things and he disapproves of others. So this will become a little bit more clear, hopefully, as we go through this. But before we get into their characters, I wanted to share one more verse, James 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? So as I said, most people today are trying to figure out that same question. Is it nature that makes us who we are, or is it nurture that makes us who we are? And today, the the jury is a little silent on that one. Most parenting books that you pick up today seem to believe that parents have the sole responsibility of shaping the personalities of their children. And that if you do a good job as a parent, your kids will turn out a very particular way. But if you do a bad job as a parent, your kids will turn out a very particular way as well. So when it comes to the fighting that's happening between Esau and Jacob, it's very clear that Rebecca is not failing as a mother while the kids are in the womb. So again, the Bible is trying to answer that question of like, when kids are at each other's throats, whose fault is it really? Well, James gives us the answer. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war within your members? We have a desire within us. And because we are living in a world with finite resources, we fight over the resources that the other person has. So in the womb, what are they fighting over? Well, the womb's kind of a small place. You know, they're probably fighting over the space that's within there. When they get out, they start fighting over resources. They start fighting over the attention of mom and dad. But we're always, as humanity, we're always going to be in a state of conflict until we can realize the redemption that exists within a relationship that we can have with God. So the two personality types that we're going to look at that Esau and Jacob perfectly represent and are also represented in most narrative stories, which uh, I was talking to my wife about it, I think is really cool. It's all over the place. (laughs) These character tropes are all over the place, if you know where to look. But Esau represents 
the hunter. It's a very particular character trope that we're going to dive into. And Jacob represents the trickster. And both characters have their own kind of arc, right? They have their own failures and faults, but they also have their own potential for redemption. So it might be kind of fun for you to figure out which one are you more like, right? It might, it might shift during the course of your lifetime. So what is the personality of the hunter? What is that trope all about? Genesis 25 verse 24 says this. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was six years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling within tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Okay, so the character of the hunter is basically summed up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to sum it up for you guys. So the character of the hum- hunter is symbolized in Esau in three ways. Number one is the fact that he's a hunter. Number two, the fact that he is hairy. And number three, the fact that he comes out red. Now, I'm not making any comments about in, any of those three things. Right? I'm just saying that there's a symbolic significance to these things in narrative, uh, in narrative stories. Okay? So if you're a hunter, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. If you're hairy, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. If you're red, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. But these things have symbolic significance that, like I said, I'm going to go over uh, throughout. So let's start with this idea that Esau is a hunter. Okay, So the writer of Genesis has already used hunter as a symbol. Genesis 10 verse 8 says this, Cush begot Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one upon the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, in most civilizations, the hunter is the guy who rules, right? He is the person who is most important within a society. They agree with the biblical authors about what the hunter represents. The disagreement is whether or not it's a good thing. So when you read those two verses, Is Nimrod supposed to be a good guy or a bad guy? Well, in most cultures, they would look at that and be like, whoa, he's a mighty hunter. That dude's a good guy. But for a shepherding community, which we're going to talk about the difference in a second, for a shepherding community, a hunter represents something that's actually not very good. So again, if you're a hunter, there's not a diss on you. But what what is a hunter? A hunter is someone who does not cultivate life or resources, but it is, he is an opportunist who captures or ensnares life for his own resources, for his own needs. Right? So a shepherd, think about the juxtaposition for a second. A shepherd is someone who multiplies life. They take responsibility for the creatures given to them. They nurture them. They take care of them. And then as the creatures grow, as they develop and procreate, they get more and more resources. So they build up the resources of the whole community and then they take their food from the flock that they're responsible for. The hunter, on the other hand, is the one who goes out into nature and takes something that's not necessarily his, right? He asserts his power, he asserts his dominance over creation, right? He is the mighty one. He contends with nature. So the hunter has that character quality to him, and it's also exhibited in the two other qualities that I mentioned before that Esau is hairy. In fact, his name is literally hairy. That's what Esau means in Hebrew. It means hairy. And if you think about hair as well, hair in the Bible is shown as like a sign of glory. It talks about gray hair in the Psalms as being a crown of glory for the elderly. It talks about in 1 Corinthians 11 that a woman's hair is actually her glory as well. And one of the most interesting parts where hair is used in the Bible is the famous Nazarite vow where people would grow out their hair for an extended period of time, and they would also abstain from things like wine and uh, touching dead bodies and stuff like that. They would abstain from these things for a second, and then when the vow was over, they would cut their hair and they would burn it as a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, that sounds weird unless you understand symbolically how ancient man understood hair, right? That hair is a sign of glory. It's like the first covering that we will have is our own hair. And so by taking your hair and cutting it and offering it to God, it's the idea of offering up your own glory to the supreme glory of God. 
When Adam and Eve fall in the garden, what's the first thing they notice? That they are naked. And what does God provide for them? A covering of hair, right? A hairy garment from animals. So Esau, if you want to think of it this way, Esau is the man who is covered in his own strength and his own glory, right? The hunter is the person who doesn't come into the world in a needy way. They're not weak. They're not oppressed. They're the one who are innately accepted by the community around them. They have innate power that they can exercise over creation, and they have a covering that emerges from themselves. The color red also fits into this. So red, for most people, is the color of passion, right? It's the color of passion. It's the color of of desire. And Esau is actually, he embodies this. So let me go to another part of this narrative to demonstrate same chapter, verse 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. Edom means red. That's what it means in Hebrew. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So the color red that's associated with him is the color of insatiable appetite. It's the color of desire or passion that can't be reined in. So it's not just saying that Esau is a passionate guy. It's saying that Esau is run by his passions. The immediate, the the present moment is what ensnares him. He doesn't think about the future. He is the one that offers up a far greater blessing for a far smaller one that he could have right now. And most children are kind of like this, right? So children kind of are innately hunters in their personality because they're a bit entitled. They're run by their passions some of them are hairy, some of them aren't, but that's not really important. Right? But the idea is that they're, they're kind of naturally like Esau's. And there's a f- funny experiment that they did with kids in marshmallows. Have you heard about this? So they have, them in a, they have them in like a little enclosed room where there's a camera. And they say to the kid, like, hey, here's a marshmallow. If you wait two minutes, I'll give you two marshmallows. And then they take off. They're like, okay, I'm going to leave you alone for two minutes. And they take off. But the you know, kids aren't smart enough to know that the camera's watching them. Right? Most kids are going to eat the marshmallow. Right? They're going to eat the marshmallow because it's better to have pleasure now than to wait for potential pleasure in the future. Right? And again, that's, that's really demonstrated in this idea of being a hunter because the hunter doesn't take responsibility for their resources. They take from nature. They also don't have a lot of self-control or control over the, their own resources that they do have governance over. Okay, So I, I figured this out, and I was like, that's so funny. That, you know, I, I love fairy tales. Beauty and the Beast, Gaston is Esau. He's clearly based on Esau. Okay? He's always wearing red. He brags about being covered in hair, and he's a hunter, right? And if you think about his personality, he is, he is clearly Esau. He is the guy that wants pleasure right now. He can't wait. He feels entitled to everything that comes his way. And the only girl that rejects him, he feels like she's done him a personal wrong that he has the right to vindicate, right? And then he gets really mad at the beast because he's a hairier guy than Vietnam. No, not right. But, you know, like, so there's, but there's something in him that feels, like, justified in having dominance over the world. There's something in him that feels entitled because, like I said, he's innately accepted from birth. He is the stronger, more dominant one. And most societies orient themselves around the hunter, right? They, they, they look at the hunter and they're like, this is the guy that needs to lead us. The strongest, most competent, most capable guy. That's the person who should be on top. The problem with the hunter is that the hunter can't actually multiply resources. All they know how to do is take someone else's resources. So most societies, when they put the hunter at the top, what does the hunter do? The hunter goes and he starts attacking and conquering other people groups. And that's what Nimrod does. Nimrod sets up the Tower of Babel and he starts dominating other people groups around him. Esau is the same way. He becomes a great nation, but he becomes a great nation through conquering other peoples. He also sets up like a weird fortress in in this rocky place within Israel. 
because Esau is all about power. It's all about accumulation of power, accumulation of resources. That's how he feels successful within himself. That's what Esau really represents, that type of personality. In fact, it's, it's not a mistake that in Sanskrit, the, the earlier word for war in Sanskrit means desire for more cows, right? So that's, that's what Esau is, right? I, I find success by taking something that is someone else's, right? I dominate someone else, and therefore I've expanded my borders and boundaries, and I've become a greater person. So the hunter, in that sense, has some good things going for him, but if he doesn't learn self-control, if he doesn't learn moderation, if he doesn't learn humility, the hunter becomes a really negative personality. So the interesting thing about Esau and Jacob is that Esau and Jacob both start out with kind of negative names. We'll talk more about Jacob's in a second. Jacob's gets changed to something positive, but notice Esau's gets changed to something even more negative. Right? So Jacob turns into Israel, Esau turns into Edom. He goes from hairy to red. Right? He goes from someone who has his own covering and own power to someone who is just ruled by his passions and has zero self-control. And that's what Edom becomes. They become synonymous with a people group that backstab, that take advantage of other people, that are ruthless, they're power hungry. Right? These are the people group that Esau begins to lead. And if you want to learn more about their downfall, you could read the very, it's a very obscure book in your Bibles. It's called Obadiah. It's one chapter, and Obadiah pronounces judgment upon the Edomites for their behavior. So it's a really good deep dive into what the children of Esau became and why God has to necessarily judge them. But a, another good verse that I think sums this up fairly well is Habakkuk 2, verse 4 through 5. Behold the proud... His soul is, upright, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at his home. Because he enlarges his desires as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all people. So you see Esau's personality in that, right? right? He's, he has insatiable desires. He's like hell. He cannot be satisfied no matter how much he obtains. Right? He is, his soul is not upright and in him. He's given to wine and drunkenness. He's proud, and he's not faithful. The faithful man, the man who walks by faith, is the man who's come in contact with the frailties and limitations of their own power and must rely upon a greater source of truth, sufficiency, salvation, and mercy. It's very hard for Esau to obtain mercy because he generally thinks that he is perfect within himself. He doesn't need a covering from God. He has a covering that emanates from his own body. Right? He is the hunter. He is the proud. He is the one that cannot be satisfied. It's also not a mistake that Satan is usually associated with a hunter within your Bible. Right? So Satan is depicted as a lion. He's a roaring lion in 1 Peter. He is the, the hunter in Proverbs chapter 7, he's the serpent, he's the leviathan, right? He is the one who hunts his prey, he's opportunistic, and he is insatiable in his desire for glory. No matter how high God places him inside of the kingdom, Satan always wants the throne that is above him, right? That's, that's the hunter personality. So now we're going to move and we're going to talk about the trickster. The trickster is another interesting personality. We see this in Jacob's name. Right? He's heel catcher. That's what his name means. So as the children are coming out of the womb, it says that Jacob grabs Esau's heel. Like, almost like, I'm going to come out first. Right? And he's grabbing Esau's heel to try to pull him back in so he can get one up above him. The trickster is seen, again, throughout literature. Uh, he's seen in Loki versus Thor. So Thor is like the hunter and Loki is the trickster. He's Prometheus, the one who steals fire from the gods. He's Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. He's Bugs Bunny, and for the Christmas season, he's Kevin McAllister, right? So he's, that's the trickster. The trickster is the person who's childish and impish. He plays pranks on other people, but he's the person, he's the jokester, he's the clown, he's the fool, he's the buffoon. He's the person that exists in an unjust power structure and uses mockery, jokes, and tricks to get what is actually owed to him. So remember, God has already spoken. Jacob is supposed to rule over Esau. But Isaac prefers Esau 
So Isaac is going against God. Isaac is actually rebelling against the word of the Lord. So Jacob is in an unjust power structure. He's underneath the supreme power of his father that's holding him down, and he's underneath Esau, who is the powerful hunter who's also putting him down. And so Jacob cannot get what's due to him by the normal means, so he has to use tricks in order to get what is actually due to him, what he's actually entitled to. Now, there's problems with the trickster that we'll get into, but notice that when the writer of Genesis, when you don't understand these symbols, this passage doesn't really make much sense. But in, uh, I think this is verse 26, it says, So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. That's actually a mistranslation. And it's a mistranslation because it's very clear that the translators didn't understand the symbolism of what a hunter is. When it says that Jacob is a mild man, that word actually means perfect or complete. Right? They translate it mild because they're like, this is supposed to be a comparison. Esau is a hunter and Jacob is perfect. But it doesn't really make any sense unless you understand that the writer of Genesis is making a comparison and he's seeing a hunter as a bad thing. Right? He's saying that the hunter makes Esau's character imperfect and Jacob not being a hunter makes him more perfect. And in fact, when they try to please their father later on, it is significant that Esau takes his present from the field and Jacob takes his present from the home. Right? So Esau is the one who has insatiable out appetites that go out. Jacob is the person who's more content within. Right? He has an inner contentedness that allows him to be more peaceful. That's why Esau is murderous and Jacob is not so murderous. Right? He's, he's, he's just like the harmless trickster. So what's wrong with the trickster? What's going on? The trickster is also associated with Satan. Satan is the trickster, right? He can't beat God because God is more powerful than him. So Satan uses deception and tricks to try to get his way, to try to get one up over the Lord. And the perfect, uh, I guess, amalgamation of these two traits is the serpent in the garden. The serpent is both a hunter and a trickster. Right, so the, the serpent hunts prey, but the serpent uses venom and cunning to ensnare and capture their prey. So the trickster can also go in bad directions. Okay? In an upside-down world, though, as we've talked about, the trickster has a pretty good role. Right? The trickster actually can do some good things. So if you think about like stories, for instance, like the emperor's new clothes, the child in the emperor's new clothes who mocks the nakedness of the emperor He's the trickster, but he's doing a good thing because he's pointing out the failures and flaws of the system that he's underneath. Every time a society becomes too corrupt, the trickster is the one who weirdly kind of sets things right. He points out the failures of the society that he's in and starts reorienting the world in the correct direction. So think about Elijah in 1 Kings. He fights the prophets of Baal and the unjust power of Ahab and Jezebel, but he does it in an indirect way. He does it through tricks, right? He, he prays for a drought within his land. And then when he goes up on Mount Carnel to face off against the prophets of Baal, he starts making fun of Baal. He starts mocking him, saying, like, maybe he can't answer you because he's on the toilet right now, right? So you, you have someone acting as a trickster, but they, they're, like, resetting the world through their tricks. Even in history, we see this. The American Revolution was not started with a bang, but with a trick. The Boston Tea Party, right? A bunch of people dressed up as Native Americans and dumped a bunch of tea into the harbor. That was the great act of rebellion. So you have, when history starts going in the wrong direction, it's weirdly reoriented through the trickster. However, there's limitations to what the trickster can do. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 12 through 14, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of, his, of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. So what Solomon is saying is that the trickster has a tendency to fall into their own trap. So think about the clown, right? The clown runs around and he tries to spray people with a hose and he gets squirted in the face, right? He throws a banana peel, then he slips on it and tears his pants, right? Even think about this story. Jacob tricks his brother twice, but who's the one that ends up 
running for his life? It's Jacob. And with Kevin McAllister, right? Kevin McAllister, he tricks the, the robbers, right? He, he plays all these pranks on them that should have killed them, but, you know, whatever. So, you know, he plays all these pranks on them. He gets them into all these traps. But at the end of the movie, he can't beat them, right? In both films, he cannot beat the robbers. They end up capturing him through his own mischief. And it takes a more mature figure to actually settle the world in a correct way. So the trickster can poke fun at the center, but the trickster can't actually recreate a new world. They're limited within their power. They need something greater. They need to mature beyond their tricks in order to become a force for good. Both the hunter and the trickster are negative if they're taken too far, but they're positive when they're taking in the right direction. So think about God for a second, Christ. Christ is also depicted as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is like a hunter. However, how does he defeat Satan? He doesn't defeat Satan through like a brawl, like where him and Satan get into a fist fight. He beats Satan through kind of a trick, right? Satan at the cross thinks he's beaten Jesus. He thinks he's outsmarted him. He's brought him to the cross. He's going to crucify him. But as Satan is mocking Jesus and bringing him down, what's really happening? Satan is falling into his own trap, right? Jesus is able to rise from the dead and defeat the powers of darkness through them believing that they've defeated him. So both tropes can be redeemed if we look at it in the correct way. Now, I think, I think it's also interesting that, uh, by the way, if, you, if you're trying to figure out which one of these you are, it does tend to go by birth order a little bit. The oldest do tend to be hunters, and the youngest do tend to be tricksters, right? can flip sometimes, but usually that's how it is, right? The oldest, you know, they have all the power and the strength within the family. They also can kind of deceive and manipulate the younger ones because they have the, the wisdom, right? And the younger one is usually the one who's overlooked by the parents and uses tricks and humor to gain attention. The great tragedy about the tricksters, though, which is ironically what makes them more easily redeemable, but also more tragic figures, is the fact that their desire, their ultimate desire, is for attention and acceptance, whereas the hunter's great desire tends to be for power and control. So if you look at Jacob, why is he a trickster? Well, he's a trickster because he wants his father's approval. He wants his father's approval so badly that he'll pretend to be his own brother to get it. Right? He, he, he wants to reset the world so bad that he desperately tricks people in order to gain acceptance. You know, you could watch any number of documentaries about famous comedians. And it is interesting that the majority of famous comedians were people that weren't really liked as kids, and they develop a sense of humor to gain attention and notoriety. Right? So a lot of tricksters, they are the, the sad clown. They are the, the people that want desperately to be loved, and they use tricks and humor in order to gain attention, affirmation, and acceptance. The great irony, though, is that because they're the trickster, no one trusts them. So because they play pranks on people, nobody trusts them. And because they can't be trusted in their words, this is what Solomon means when he says the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Because no one can trust what the trickster says, because no one believes what they're saying, nobody takes them seriously. And because no one takes them seriously, they can't develop real relationships with other people. The identity of the trickster has to grow up. If you're a five-year-old boy playing, playing pranks on people, good on you. If you're a 40-year-old man playing pranks on people, it might be time to grow up a little bit, right? It's okay for a time, but it's an identity that has to shift over time. So for the rest of the sermon, we're going to look at how we're going to take a, a, a really backed out, generalized view of how Jacob is redeemed and why the redemption that Jacob receives was open to Esau at the same time. Because weirdly, both the trickster and the hunter need each other. By the trickster tricking the hunter, the hunter is supposed to gain humility. He's supposed to realize, I'm not as strong as I thought I was, and maybe I need to kind of learn from my little brother instead of becoming murderous, which is what Esau does. By the hunter trying to kill the trickster, the trickster is supposed to learn that maybe life is about more than just pranks, and maybe I need to grow up a little bit. 
That's ultimately what happens to Jacob. So Jacob has to flee from his parents' home. And when he flees from his parents' home, and all the the points I'm about to break down, we're going to go into much deeper detail as we get to them in the narrative. But I just want to, again, take this, this generic look, because Jacob's story is our story. His journey to becoming Israel is our journey to becoming the same thing. The first step in his journey is he goes out in the wilderness and he sees a ladder that reaches to heaven. There's a lot of beauty in that symbol. There's a lot of reasons as to why that symbol is presented to him. But essentially what it is, if if you want just a big generalized version of this, what the ladder to heaven represents is it it represents a bridge that brings Jacob in contact with what is highest. Now, why is that important? Tricksters, by necessity, believe that what is above them is oppressive. Think about Jack and the giant beanstalk. So I said Jack is the trickster. The beanstalk goes up into the heavens. What's waiting for him up there? A giant that wants to eat him. So tricksters naturally distrust power structures. They naturally distrust the things that are in the highest. What God is showing Jacob is he's saying, what is in the highest? ultimately is on your side. There might be a lot of things in between you and what's highest that are against you, but ultimately, when you get to the highest, what is up in the highest place is on your side. It is supportive of you. It is for you. And Jacob begins to wrestle with that idea that maybe what is beyond me is actually on my side. This is also why Hollywood is so interesting. So if you notice that Hollywood never makes a movie about a dominant force that wins, it's always the underdog story, right? Even Star Wars, you get, you know, you get to the end of the first trilogy, which is, you know, for Star Wars fans, that's the only three movies that exist. But, you know, like if you want to keep going, you can. But, you know, you get to the end of the original trilogy and then they start episode seven and they're the rebellion again. And you're like, whoa, wait, they won. Why are they the rebellion again? Because Hollywood is usually made up of tricksters. Right? Hollywood is usually made up of a bunch of people who use their creative powers in order to reset the world. They don't have strength or power in themselves, so they gain it through deception. Tricksters are also storytellers. Right? Half a lying is telling a story, isn't it? And if you could tell a convincing enough story, you can convince people into what you're believing. So Hollywood is made up of tricksters, and so usually in Hollywood stories, what is highest is always oppressive and bad. And that's why they they tend to like the figure of Satan a little bit in Hollywood. But what God is showing Jacob is that's not true. What is highest is good. You need to serve what is highest. You need to submit yourself to what is highest because what is above you is actually good for you. The fascinating thing, though, is that Jacob never climbs the ladder. So in every story where the hero is presented with a way to heaven, they climb it. Jacob doesn't climb it. He stays on the ground. Instead, he starts to use his wit to try to trick God. So the rest of his life, he's trying to deceive God into giving him a blessing. He goes to his uncle Laban's house, and Laban is the better trickster than Jacob. He keeps taking advantage of Jacob over and over again. And Jacob uses weird designs and wiles, right? He's wily coyote. He's trying to get one oak over his uncle, but everything he does blows up in his face. So he has to run, and God brings him back into contact with his brother Esau. And we'll talk more about that story in a second. But no matter what Jacob does, he can't undo his nature until God does it for him. He is always the trickster. The second thing that he does is he becomes a shepherd. So like I said, shepherds are actually the ones who should be ruling a society. Now what the shepherd is, is he's actually, the shepherd is the true evolution of both the hunter and the trickster. The shepherd is the ideal identity, if you want to word it that way. The shepherd is the one who takes responsibility for what's around him and multiplies resources as opposed to taking what belongs to somebody else. So the trickster wants to take what belongs to the person above them. The person above them wants to take everything else. The shepherd, instead, builds up resources for everybody, right? So this would be the entrepreneur within our society. This would be the person who innovates and creates opportunities for everybody, as opposed to taking what belongs to other people. The really negative thing 
about our culture is, like I said, it's really predominated by tricksters and hunters. And so everybody thinks that politics is a zero-sum game. That if one side wins, the other side loses. That if one company dominates, every other company has to suffer. And that's not true. If people are able to actually grow their identities and mature, they can create opportunities for everybody by developing and multiplying resources, which is something we have the ability to do as human beings. So Jacob goes and he becomes a shepherd, and he actually becomes really good at becoming a shepherd. He starts learning how to work for his own resources. He starts learning how to multiply things, and he ends up becoming incredibly wealthy as a result of this. And as he goes back to be with Esau, so God finally tells him, okay, you've, you've learned something. You've matured. You're no longer trying to get it one up over the people who are above you. You're trying to only make your own way. And by doing so, you've made life better for everybody. Okay, now it's time to go back and confront your greatest fear. It's time to go back and confront Esau. So Jacob's called to what you'd call man up, right? <laughs> confront his greatest terror which is the only way that you're going to grow up, by the way. The more you try to run or avoid challenges, the more immature you become. Right? The only way to actually man up is to actually confront that which makes you terrified. So Jacob goes and he confronts his brother, but again, he's still the trickster. So the whole time he's going there, he tries to give Esau gifts and resources to try to quell his rage. But as he gets closer and closer, Esau also advances more and more. Finally, when he realizes that there's, there's no way out, he sends his wife and kids away from him so he could face his brother face to face. And then the most amazing thing happens. And it's, this is why I love Jacob so much. God appears to Jacob. And you know what Jacob does? He tries to fight God, which is amazing because that's what all of us would do. We all think like, oh, if only God would show up in the flesh, we would just love him. It's like, no, you'd probably try to wrestle him too because that's who we are. We're not people who want to be men of faith. We don't want to be people who rely upon the mercy of someone who's higher than us. We want to be people who guarantee blessing through our own resources and power. Right? So he goes and he wrestles God, and God's such a good sport. He's like, okay, I'll wrestle you all night. Right? So he wrestles Jacob all night. He's wearing him out. Dawn is about to break, and God dislocates his hip. Jacob is now in a position where he can't run. He can't hide. He can't barter. He can't talk his way out of what's coming. And so it says he clings to the waist of God and he begs him for a blessing. He says, unless you bless me, I will not let go. And God says, your name is no longer Jacob. It's no longer usurper. It's Israel. Now, Israel has a lot of different definitions to it, but the most basic definition is the one who wrestles with God. I know. What does that name mean? It means that the person who's become Israel is the person who's recognized something. My ultimate good in life comes only from God. If I want a blessing, if I want growth, if I want development, if I want salvation, it's only going to come through God. And so I must go before the throne of God, and I must contend with Him in order to to receive a blessing. I'm not going to get it anywhere else. But because Jacob has still fallen, it's not just one who's ruled by God or one who is underneath God or submissive to God. It's one who wrestles with God because we always fall back into the flesh and we try to wrestle from God that which he is already going to offer to us. James puts it this way. So we started this sermon with James. Why do people fight? Because our desires combat with one another and we're trying to take what doesn't belong to us. So we war, we fight, and we contest. James 4 verse 1 says this, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and you don't have. You murder and covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it upon your own pleasures. Jesus, in his ministry, he goes to a well. It's in John chapter 4. He goes to a well, and he confronts a woman there. And the woman wants to do what Jacob is doing. She tries to wrestle with Jesus. She does it with words and not with her body, but still, they get into a little bit of a, a conflict. And as they're talking, Jesus said, 
if you only knew the person whom you were speaking to, and you would ask of me, and I would give you rivers of living water. What Jesus is telling the woman is the same thing that James is telling us. The reason why we are unhappy, the reason why if you're the trickster, you're always trying to get one up over the person who's above you, or you're the hunter and you're always trying to dominate people who are around you, is because you think that happiness, pleasure, and satisfaction is out there somewhere if only you can find it and earn it with your own power or wit. The person who becomes Israel is the one who realizes that my ultimate satisfaction and salvation can only come from the throne of God. And if I want it, I have not because I ask not. That I'm not contending with God. I'm not going before him and saying, Lord, this is my desire. And I want you to fill what only you can fill. I want you to satisfy what only you can satisfy. I want you to give me hope that only you can offer me. And I want you to save me, which I can never do within my own strength or wisdom. Help me, Lord, to be reliant upon you. That is the person who has finally found rest. Augustine of Hippo, in his great book, Confessions, he words it this way, Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power and thy wisdom infinite. And thee would man praise, man but a particle of thy creation, man that bears about him his own mortality, the witness of his sin, the witness that thou resisteth the proud, yet would praise, would man praise thee, he but a particle of thy creation. Thou awakest us to delight in thy praise, for thou made us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it reposes in thee. All right, until you can figure out that your heart and your soul can only be satisfied in God, you will always have an attitude and a character that is unsatisfied because it's looking for ultimate reconciliation, ultimate purpose where it can't be found. We're looking below when we should be looking above. Right? So I hope you guys are excited to go through the rest of Jacob's story and see this play out in more vivid detail. But let's pray. Father, we praise you and we thank you but what, again, what we cannot get in our own strength, you have offered to us freely. What we could not earn, you have given to us through your own personal sacrifice. God, I pray that we would learn the lessons of Jacob, that we would learn to stop contesting with the world to get the pleasure and satisfaction that you offer so freely and willingly. Help us to rely upon you. Help us to submit ourselves to you. And through your Son we pray. Amen. So part of what we're doing right now when we take communion is a commemoration of that fact. So again, as as we always say, that communion is available to those who have a personal relationship with God, who have given their life to Him. If that doesn't describe you, I ask that you let the elements pass you on by. But Jesus in John chapter 6, He says, He is the bread of life, that anyone who comes to Him will never hunger and never thirst. When we partake of the communion elements, we remember that. We remember that all of our hungers in life, all of our desires and all of our thirsts, are satisfied and completed in Christ himself. 